Welcome back to Season Liberally. Today we are going to be making a wonderful date night dish, short ribs and polenta. Hope you hang out, stick around. On occasion I'll stumble across some threads on the internet and lots of times people will ask a question, they'll say something like, What's one piece of advice that you would give me? Uh, you know, or what's one piece of advice you wish you had when you were younger? And inevitably, one of the responses will be something like, learn how to cook something really well. And then that way you'll be able to impress your significant other or your friends or whatever it is. But learn how to cook one thing really well. So my goal today is to teach you how to cook one thing really well. Now I'm not teaching this to you because I want you to impress your friends or impress your significant other. Oh, those are great, of course, great uh, perks to learn how to do this. I want you to learn how to cook something really well so that then you'll go on and learn to cook another thing really well and then another thing and then another thing and another thing and it'll, it'll ignite your passion for cooking. Because once you have success, you're gonna keep on trying to make more and more and more uh, exciting, different foods and keep on trying to recreate that success. And this recipe is a great jumping off point for it because it's one of those recipes you get in a restaurant, they're gonna charge you 50 bucks a plate for it, and if you can make it for yourself at home for a fraction of the cost, you're suddenly thinking, wow, I can really just branch out and make some really amazing stuff. So let's get started. We're gonna make short ribs and polenta today. So. Uh, of course, we're going to need short ribs. So the first thing we do is we got to go out and buy some short ribs. Now, this, these short ribs were bought locally by me. They're twenty dollars for some short ribs. So it's not a cheap meat. It used to be a lot cheaper uh, back before people really started to enjoy it, and back before restaurants started to uh, go out of their way to stock it, so that people could, uh, so that they could create a, a, a cheap cut of meat and then charge you a nice amount for it. Now. When you go out to a restaurant, you would get one of these, right? So when it comes to the plate, you'll get one of these pieces of meat. Now, in my version, you're gonna get two, and then you get two servings worth, right? So you're already doubling it. But seriously, $20 for, a, uh, some, for what is really just two servings is quite a bit. So it's understandable that this is not an everyday type of meal. Now. What these are is this is, this is the, the rib of the animal with a nice large piece of meat attached to it. Now if you look at this meat, you can see that it has a ton of subcutaneous fat in it, right? So we've got these beautiful marbling as you look through each one of these pieces, right? There's lots of marbling. It's got big, thick fibers too. If you look, you can see how thick the fibers are on this meat. That means two things. When we cook it correctly, all that fat's gonna dissolve and flavor the meat and make it nice and, and beautiful and moist. And two, these, uh, this, this meat that's in here is very flavorful, but very tough, right? You wouldn't just be able to throw this on the, on the grill real quick, saute it on each side, run it to the table blue. It would be like chewing gum. It would be literally terrible to eat. So these have to cook for an exceedingly long time. And, they have to cook low and slow in moist heat to help, uh, to help dissolve all the fat that's in there and let it, it just uh, infuse with the meat. So what we're gonna do to start out is I'm gonna get a plate and I'm gonna salt and pepper these and set them on the side. I wanna try to get some salt on here early so that it gets an opportunity to penetrate these. Now, you could even, if you wanted to, salt these the night before put them in your fridge, you know, uncovered. That's what they do when they, uh, when they make uh, dry aged meat is they just put meat in the fridge uncovered for a very long time. And what that does is it removes the moisture. Now, you know, if you watch this channel at all, you know, you want to remove the moisture from your food. And this is just starting the process if you do it the night before. We're not going to be able to do that with just a few minutes, but we definitely want to get the salt on there as early as possible. So while we're making our mise en place, we're going to salt these. 
So here's a tip so you don't have to spin them around and salt them. You could just salt the bottom of your plate and then lay them nice and flat in that salt. And then salt the other sides like so. Now I'm not going to be putting a lot of salt in this food, right? This is going to be pretty much it until the very end. But we want to make sure that they're salted. I'm going to put a little bit of pepper on them too. All right, I'll put them on the side for now. All right, we are going to need to dice one onion. So we're going to need mirepoix for this. The recipe is one onion to two carrots and two stalks of celery. So I am going to dice an onion. Now the onion doesn't have to be like diced very finely. This is going to cook for quite some time in the oven. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a fine dice. Uh, I'm going to do it at like a medium dice. We're also going to strain the sauce at the end of this recipe. So, um, so I don't have to worry about, uh, about being as careful as I might if I was serving these vegetables. Like I say, just a, you know, a coarse dice. All right, so now for my, uh, for my celery, while I only have a couple of stalks here, a couple of these stalks are pretty puny, right? And I would normally just use two nice size stalks, but I don't have two nice size stalks. What I have is some puny ones. So I'm using enough, what I think would be, you know, two nice size stalks. This one's like a smallish stalk. This one's tiny, tiny. So I'm just, I'm just using what I think would equal about two stalks of celery. And now with this, I'm not gonna cut it in a way that nece necessarily, I'm not gonna dice it. I'm just, I'm just roughly chopping it. And I'm just going to peel the carrots here and then again, roughly chop them. I'm not going to go through the, the trouble of dicing them. There'll be big rounds in here and that's going to be okay. This one's nice and woody. I am going to cut the center just a little bit. So the very end is a giant rounds. And then the rest into little rounds. So now, like I said, we are not uh, we're not worried about what goes into this sauce because we are going to strain it later. And that means that I don't really have to do much when it comes to my time. I could, I could, if I wanted to, pull off a bunch, you know, just throw a bunch off, but I don't have to. I can actually throw the whole, the whole stick in there with the leaves, and uh, this is going to flavor it just fine. Now, um, these are relatively skimpy, so I, I'm essentially calling this two. So if you have a nice big one, you know, you want two, two pieces, two branches, so I got two branches at a time. So I'm going to put two, uh, what I would call like two sprigs of parsley. It's like, you know, about this much worth of parsley in here. And I'm not going to cut it. But when you get it from the grocery store, sometimes it can be a little gritty, right? It grows in dirt and they don't wash it off well. And so that can add grit to your sauce. Now that will go through the sieve and will wind up in your dish at the end, which you don't want. You don't want to have a gritty sauce. You want somebody biting into a piece of dirt when they're eating your food. So I'm going to rinse this off and then dry it off so that when we do throw it in, there, there's no risk that there's going to be any dirt in it. This recipe will also require you to have a cup of red wine. Uh, you're going to want to use a dry red wine. Don't use a sweet wine. Use a dry red wine. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter what kind of wine you use, but you know, many chefs say if you're going to cook with it, make sure you'd want to drink it. They you know, most of the time would say, you know, go buy a bottle of wine you would normally drink and then drink that. And, uh, you know, while you're cooking, use that one cup, throw it into the, into the dish. I also am going to need a, uh, two cups of stock. Now you can, if you want, uh, make your own stock. That's what this is. Now this looks like might, might be frozen. This is not frozen. This is just really, really good stock that just happens to be unbelievably gelatinous. This is absolutely gold standard stock that I make myself that is, and you can see, I don't know if you could see this on the, on the thing, you could see it wiggling. That's like, it's like jello. That's good stock, right? That's outstanding stock. 
You can make your own stock. You can follow a recipe here on this channel to learn how to make your own brown stock. It's real easy to do. All it takes is time. And in fact, if you have a pressure cooker, it takes even less time. So you can make your own stock, which I would encourage, of course, or you can go out to the store and buy some stock. Now the boxes of stock are kind of weak. They're really pretty weak. This better than bouillon, I really quite like uh, quite a bit. Now it's gonna add some salt content to your food, which is why we're not salting anything. I'm not using my good stock on this today. I normally would, of course, but I'm trying to show you a recipe that you can make on your own, right? I don't, wanna, I don't want you to like run away because I told you to make stock and that's a whole other thing you wanna do. I want you to be able to start and finish this recipe without other, other uh, ingredients that you have to make beforehand. So we're gonna use this better than bouillon today. Uh, we're gonna put some in a, a measuring cup and then we're, gonna, we're just gonna fill it up with some warm water to get it so that it dissolves. And I really like this better than bouillon stuff. I think it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not, it's certainly not, uh, it's certainly not as good as regular stock, but I will say what it does, what it does have is a, quite a lot of flavor and it's adding flavor in a way that I think, um, you know, it's adding that, uh, that salty sort of flavor that a lot of people miss in their food because they don't season as well as they should. And so um, I think that this stuff is really quite good and, it, and it, it serves the purpose for what you need it for, right? Very often, if I'm cooking something that, uh, that I just used a little water in, I might even just throw a little bit of this in, either chicken or beef. I even have a vegetable one in there for, for when I'm making vegetables. So you can, you can just you know, add a little extra depth and a little flavor to your dishes just by dropping a, like one tablespoon of this stuff in there. Um, so we're just gonna wait for our water to warm up and then make our stock. So in order to cook this recipe, you are gonna need a pot with a lid. It's gonna go into the oven. So uh, the lid needs to fit tight, okay? If your lid doesn't fit super tight, get a little bit of tin foil, wrap it around your lid and just set it on there. And that will help um, seal up anything. Now this one fits perfectly, right? Tiny little bit of play in it, but that's okay. This is exactly where you wanna be. All right, I got my hot kettle. I'm gonna pour in a couple cups. And then we're gonna stir it so that we know it all dissolved. You don't really have to do this mainly because uh, it's gonna cook for so long, but I do like to make sure that it is distributed well into that. And I'll give it another stir before I get started. All right, last ingredient for this is about a half a cup of flour. These have been sitting out the whole time we get my mise en place. I am just gonna dredge these quickly in some of this flour, right? Now, what the flour is gonna do is it's gonna do two things. One, it's gonna help it brown a little bit, right? But that's not what we're really worried about. What we wanna do is we wanna add a little thickening agent to this early. And we add a little thickening agent to this early in the recipe, that means later, when we go out of our way to thicken this, it's gonna be one step up. Now, one difficulty with using stock with salt in it is uh, we're gonna to have to work with that seasoning, right? When you don't season something very much ahead of time, you can then add seasonings later, but when it comes to this stock, we really can't do that, right? This stock already has a lot of salt in it, so we're gonna have to work around that. So to work around that, let's add our flour now so that, the, that, that our starting point for the sauce later on is already thicker than it needs to be. Okay, so butter normally has a pretty low smoke point. It'll start to smoke pretty quickly. But if you add some oil to your pan ahead of time and then drop your butter in, the butter will not smoke as quickly and it will flavor your dish without burning. So nice little tip to try to uh, use butter while you cook. To this hot pan, we're just gonna add our short ribs. Now our short ribs, we wanna keep them a little distant apart, right? And we're just gonna cook each side of them. You know, four sides, if you can get the ends, great. If not, no big deal. But we're gonna to try to brown them all. Now I am gonna keep this on the side here 
because I'm gonna take them out of here in a second so we can cook all the rest of our mirepoix and then add them back in. So I'm gonna keep this plate, I'm not gonna throw it, I'm not gonna wash it or get a new plate. Now this is gonna produce a lot of fat as we go through and then at the end it's gonna produce a lot of fat. We're gonna defat this later. So don't worry if there looks like there's a lot of fat in the pan, it's not a big deal. We're gonna defat it before we serve it. So. so the goal here is not to cook them all the way through, it's just to get them brown, right? We just wanna get them brown. Brown food tastes better, period. So that's what we're doing, we're browning them. All right, they go off to the side. We're leaving this in here. In goes our mirepoix. Now we don't have to cook this for very long, maybe three, four minutes. We just wanna get the onion to look like it's translucent. Now we are gonna do one reduction. We're gonna reduce the wine before we add the stock. Um, we're not just gonna throw the wine in and then throw the stock in. We are gonna reduce the wine. Um, but that's the only reduction we're gonna do and then the rest of the time it's gonna spend, it's gonna spend in the oven. We're putting this in the oven so that there's not like a chance for you to burn it, right? It's a lot easier to maintain a proper temperature in a covered dish in the oven than it is on a stove top. You can do this on the stove top, turn it out to low, you know, on the simmer. But you gotta keep your eye on it because it might scorch. So you put it in the, in, the, in the oven, you don't ever have to worry about that. I preheated my oven right now to 325 convection. That's 350 still oven. And it's gonna cook like that for two hours in there. All right, this has been cooking for a couple minutes. You can see the onion is translucent now. There's a couple of opaque pieces in here, but for the most part, it's translucent. That's fine. We don't need to go much, go much deeper than that. We are gonna pour in our, our wine though, right now. And then we're just gonna bring it to a rip and boil and just burn off all the liquid in here. So it's gonna take, you know, 10 minutes or so to burn off all that liquid. All right, almost dry here. And you don't need to get it bone dry, right? You wanna, what you wanna do is you wanna, you wanna get rid of most of that moisture. But when I pull my, my spoon through, what I don't wanna do is have a big bunch of pooling. And right now it's, it's mostly dry and that's plenty dry. It doesn't need to be much different than that. I'm gonna throw my herbs in here. Two big sticks of herbs, put them in there. Pour in my stock. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take bone side down and just nestle. Nestle each one into this liquid. And if there's any leftover uh, anything that's gonna drip off your plate, any drippings, you could throw it in there. There's not really much on mine. All right, this has to come to a boil one more time. We are gonna cover it first and just let it come to a boil. Once it comes to a boil, we're gonna stick it in the oven. All right, we are at a boil. So, into the oven this goes two hours. Then we're gonna turn the oven down at about 25 degrees. We're gonna cook it for another 45 minutes. So, almost three hours in the oven. Let's put it in there. inside. Here's our sauce. Here's our wonderfully cooked pieces of meat. So what we're going to do is we're going to set those aside. I'm going to just pull the meat off and it should come right off the bone. I'm going to pull it off. Now I have to pull a little piece off later. There's this little piece here that's inedible. We're going to cut that off later, but we're going to leave this alone. We're gonna take just the meat off. We're gonna to try to leave the bones in here if we can.
All right. Now, I'm gonna take this and pour it into my strainer. I'm gonna strain out everything I can from this. So we're gonna let this sit on the side, we're gonna strain it out. We're gonna cover this with some foil. These are gonna rest while we cook our polenta and while we get our sauce ready. So we are gonna just cover these and set these on the side for now. All right, we're gonna make our polenta now and we're gonna get it started and then we're gonna fix our sauce up. So we have a pot, tall sided pot. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add polenta to this boiling, we're gonna boil some water and some milk. Now you can use whatever kind of flavorful liquid you want. You wanna use stock, use stock. You wanna use milk, you can use milk. Water is fine. Whatever kind of flavorful liquid you, you think will work, Probably will work. Water-based is what you want to be at, right? So we're looking at right now. You can I'm, you can also do a mix, which is what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to put in two cups of water, three cups of milk, and it's five to one for polenta. So I have one cup of polenta. Now some people say you can add this. Well, before this comes to a boil, just stir it up and let it come to a boil. I'm not. Per, uh, particularly crazy about that method. I like to do it like I make like cream of wheat, bring it up to a boil, and then I throw my polenta in. Before we continue on though, I wanna salt this. I don't wanna, I don't wanna go too crazy because I'm gonna be adding Parmesan cheese to this, but I will put about a teaspoon, maybe a teaspoon and a half of salt in there just to get it so it's, there's some salt in there because this will be a very bland food if we don't add salt to this. So this has gotta come up to a boil. We're just gonna wait for it to come up to a boil. All right, it's starting to boil. You can see it's starting to rise up, right? I use milk, so milk will flash up and rise up if you don't pay attention to it. So I'm going to take it off the heat. That's how you make it so milk doesn't overflow, by the way. Turn the heat down. So here we go. Stir it in, nice and slow. I'm just making sure there's no lumps. All right, so now this has got to come back up to a boil. It'll only take a second. And when it does, I'm gonna turn it down nice and low. It's gonna start spitting, right? Once it starts thickening up, we just wanna cook it for like 10 minutes and we're gonna stir it pretty frequently. You know, maybe every 30, 40 seconds, you're gonna give it a nice whisk. You can see it's starting to bubble here. Give it another stir. And it just starts thickening and you can tell after a couple minutes, it's gonna get real thick. And that's when we're gonna turn it down once it starts getting nice and thick. All right, you see how thick that's getting? Now we're gonna turn it down to low and we're gonna let it cook for like 10 minutes, stirring it every once in a while. You can go 15 minutes. Just wanna stir it, make sure it doesn't burn, just keep it going. All right, I'm gonna take my reserved liquid and I'm gonna add it to my pan. So this was the liquid that was in the bottom of the, uh, of the braise. And we need to get this hot, we need to get it warm. Uh, you can taste this now to see where the salt content is. If it's really salty, you're going to probably want to add a thickener right away. So I know mine needs to reduce just a touch, so I'm going to let it get, come up to temperature and reduce, and then we're going to thicken it as a sauce. So I'm going to use a beurre manier to thicken this. That's equal parts butter and flour smashed together with your hand. Now, you can use uh, cornstarch and water to thicken this if you want perfectly viable. 
and uh, it'll be a different type of sauce. The, the thickening agent just changes it a little. And it's not, for me, for, for savory dishes, unless it's like a sweet and sour or something, I normally try to stay away from cornstarch. Um, I think a beurre does a better job. So it's equal parts butter and flour. And then we're gonna just toss a little in once it boils. And it's at the, at the salinity level we want the sauce to be at. And then we'll just, we're just gonna toss this in to thicken it up so that it can thicken up for the rest of the sauce. And then we just pour, we're just gonna pour this over the top of everything when it's done. You just wanna get it smooshed up with your hands. Try to get it so there's no powder. What you don't want is a powdery mess of flour. What you want is to try to coat all the pieces of this uh, flour with butter so that when it hits, the butter melts and the flour will be separate from each piece. Just like a roux, except for in this case, you're not cooking it beforehand. This is a way to qu quickly thicken something after the fact, right? You could use a roux if you had a roux cooked and cooled in your kitchen somewhere, you could certainly use it, but we don't have one. We're just gonna use this beurre It's a fast, easy way to thicken a sauce. While everything cooks and comes to temperature, I did tell you about one piece of this that needs to come off. So on the bottom, there is an inedible piece that attaches to the bone. And that piece has to be removed. That piece, if you look here, do you see this flap? This little piece has to be removed. Now, I, I'm just using my hands here, but you can use a fork to try to pull that off of there. A knife will do it. My hands do a great job. As you can see, it's just coming right off. You wanna to try to pull as little meat off as possible with it. But that piece is inedible, right? So this piece here, inedible. You can't eat that, it's like chewing gum. Once it's off though, the rest of the, of the, the short rib is completely edible. So if I just reach over and just pull, it'll come right off. And that's what I wanna do. Now there's a piece of meat on this. I'm, I don't wanna lose the meat, so I'm gonna pull the meat off. This helps if you, have if you have gloves, but you can do it with a fork too. And you can just slide the fork in like so, and it'll separate. But you gotta remove that little piece, okay? You can't serve these with that little piece in there because that is not edible and it's downright gross. It's really genuinely like the only piece of this that you can't eat, but it is it is supremely unappetizing to get one of these. So just pull these little, these little uh, pieces that connect to the bone off and the rest of the meat is fully edible. But as you can see, there's, you know, there's quite a bit of them in here. So, um, so you want, and I, I also wanna go through and make sure that I, uh, I get all the meat off of here. I don't wanna, what I don't want is for uh, any of this beautiful meat to disappear and get thrown away with these inedible portions. We're looking pretty good. So we are gonna whisk in some butter. Now I know mine has reduced a touch, which is where I wanted it to be. And now you wanna throw in like a tablespoon of this, right? And then just whisk the heck out of it. And as it melts, it'll release that that flour into this and that'll be what thickens it. And then once it's gone, we'll check to see what the thickening power of that piece was and if it was thick enough or not. If it's now thick enough, we're gonna take it off the, off the heat. If it wasn't, we're gonna add more. It's gotta keep boiling though and you gotta keep whisking. Now I can tell you just from looking at this, there's a nice sheen on there. It's looking like it's pretty good. It's coating the back of a spoon. It could use a touch more, which I'm gonna add just a bit more. And we're gonna stir it. Yeah, that's the stuff. I can see it now. 
Once you start getting big bubbles on the bottom, that's where you want to be. I didn't even use a whole tablespoon. Used about half of what I had. Bermanier keeps in the freezer for about a month if you don't use it and you want to save it. All right, you see how that's bubbling? I can tell you right away without even putting the, the, the spoon in there that it's done, but you can see it's done. We're gonna take it off the heat. Let it sit for a few minutes because we're gonna construct this whole piece. All right, so you got this beautiful polenta that we've been stirring on occasion about every 30 seconds. It's nice and creamy, right? If it gets any lumps in it, you see any lumps start to form, just whisk the hell out of it. We got three tablespoons of butter. We're gonna drop those in and just start stirring. We wanna melt that butter in here, get a nice sheen on it. We're just stirring it until that butter melts. All right, I'm gonna kill my heat because I am gonna add Parmesan cheese to this. Now, if you're gonna add cheese to this, a hard cheese is nice because it has a lot of flavor, but you can add other cheeses to this. Cheesy polenta is amazing. It has a lot of flavor. So feel free to explore whatever cheeses you like. Gruyere is amazing in this. A cheddar would be good. But this really goes well with uh, the short rib Parmesan does. I'm gonna put about, I'm gonna keep stirring it. I'm looking at, you know, right now that's about a quarter cup. And I'm just gonna stir it so it melts. And I'm gonna add a little more. I want it to be nice and cheesy. There we go, I can smell it now. So I added about a half a cup of Parmesan of, uh, shredded Parmesan. Let's taste it and see if it needs flavorings at all. I need salt. I'm going to put a little salt in here. Taste it again. Right where it should be. All right, so let's construct our dish. A little bit of polenta in the bottom. Let's put some sauce on this. And voila, that is our dish. That is four hours of construction to make this, but let me tell you something, absolutely gonna be outstanding, I can guarantee it. All right, so what's the test to see how well this is cooked? Let me get a knife so I can hold it in place while I shred it. No, I mean, this isn't a steak knife, this is a butter knife. Look at this just shred. Just falls apart, right? See it shredding? That's so little effort to just shred it, right? That's how you know it's cooked correctly. All right. I'm gonna take a piece of this with some polenta and a bit of sauce. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. What is so amazing about this dish, like I said earlier, when we're talking about the fat layers inside of the meat, all that does is turn this into an absolutely glorious, glorious piece of meat to eat. 
It's very flavorful, right? Talked about it earlier. Big pieces, there's big pieces of muscle in there and that's just really, really tough. But if you cook it long enough, it gets nice and tender. And this is cooked absolutely perfectly. It's flavored correctly. The polenta is creamy, right? It's not a block of polenta and it's not too runny. It's kind of the perfect texture. It's exactly what you want, what you're looking for in polenta. I like the five to one ratio on polenta. You can go, if you like thicker polenta, you can go four to one. I like the five to one myself. But really, I mean, like that's kind of exactly where you want to be for the polenta and exactly where you want to be for this short rib. I hope you try this at home. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I encourage you to like, share, subscribe, help the channel grow. And until next time, season liberally. Oh,